Bienvenido, muchas gracias, uh, Delma uh, y todos, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you also to Lucia and Maria for the interpretation. I'll do my best to speak clearly and slowly um, so you can keep up. Uh, thank you all for being here. I see, I saw at least one person I recognized from uh, the talk, Joshua Mayeritz's talk two days ago. Uh, Fernando, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I've been given uh, a very large topic, uh, Marsha McLuhan's legacy. Um, of course, anytime you talk about Marsha McLuhan, there are so many places to go um, that it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. I used to be worried about filling an hour, um, but I, I've come to learn that I have no problem talking for an hour or more. The challenge is, is more to, to fill it well and uh, succinctly um, and keep things to the point. So I've, I've been given a few topics to cover, um, space, time, and poetry, uh, McLuhan and the arts, laws of media, the medium is the message. Um, and I think I'll start by just um, speaking a little bit about who Marsha McLuhan was uh, to give a bit of context. So, and maybe we'll start with who he was and, and venture through these topics and, and end up with a few thoughts on uh, what his legacy is. Uh, so Marsha McLuhan, uh, for one thing, he was my grandfather, <laughs> so um, I'll always be speaking about him from a mixture of the personal and uh, also what I've learned over the years because um, I was only two years old when he died, so I didn't get to know him very well in person. But um, as it happens, uh, and, and speaking about the erasure of time and space, um, because he was such a prominent person, he is everywhere around us still. He's here in his books in this library. This is Eric McLuhan's library. Um, he's on YouTube in various speeches and interviews. He's in magazines. Um, he's in audio recordings. Um, there are hundreds of hours of Marshall McLuhan to listen to, um, never mind even his, his works in print. Uh, so it's a, it's a curious thing to have one's grandfather, though he passed 40 years ago, um, still very much with us. And I'm very fortunate uh, in that. So, um, so to me, Marshall McLuhan was my grandfather. Uh, he was a Canadian. Uh, he was born in the Western uh, provinces of Canada to a small family uh, and raised in Edmonton, uh, sorry, born in Edmonton, raised in Winnipeg. Uh, and he comes from an interesting family. His father of Irish extraction uh, was a conversationalist and uh, a bit of a musician uh, and known for, for having a good time and a laugh. His mother, Elsie, was what we call an elocutionist. And an elocutionist, uh, elocutionista, I don't know what this, if there's a Spanish word, but um, an elocutionist was someone who uh, was a performer basically. She studied drama and poetry and performance and would give one woman performances of uh, plays, um, readings of poetry. Uh, so she was very accomplished and um, highly regarded and well known in her time. And this is the early 20th century, um, 1920s, 30s. Uh, so she would go to church halls or, or basements or um, theaters and give a give a uh, performances of plays where she would play all the parts. And you can imagine this took uh, a lot of, of study and uh, rehearsal. So Marshall grew up in a very performative, um, literary even household. Um, when he went to university, however, he started in mechanical engineering because as he said, he was interested in the structure of things and how things worked. Uh, after the first year, he switched to English literature uh, and would stay in English literature 
for the rest of his studies and indeed for the rest of his life and career. This is a very important point because um, what gets lost in the conversation about media and technology is the fact that his root began in English, his work began in English literature. Uh, he taught his entire career about English literature and poetry. Um, and in fact, it was his work in literature which informed his work in technology. Uh, when, I, when I talk about Marshall McLuhan, uh, I like to use his own words. And I always encourage people to go back to primary sources, uh, see what Marshall had to say, uh, because like the broken telephone, the further you get away from, from the original speech, the more it gets diluted and distorted. Um, and so for the best understanding, uh, I find it's good to return to as early as possible. Now with Marshall, you have to keep in mind that he was a lover of words um, and he used them. So uh, especially for um, people who English is not your first language, I would recommend having a good dictionary close at hand. I use a dictionary very often when reading his works. Um, oh, I dropped something here. I have a, a stack of materials here to, to consult. So um, this book was put together uh, by uh, Eugene McNamara, and it's the literary criticism of Marshall McLuhan, 1943 to 1962. Um, and Marshall's early career was in writing book reviews, essentially, um, which he made a little bit of money off submitting reviews to magazines. But his reviews are very interesting because uh, he's talking about this or that book, but he works his own ideas into it. So um, it's very valuable to read over what he had to say. Well, Marshall... Um, provides a foreword in this book, and, and I'll read a little bit from it because it talks about his journey from Canada to Europe to Cambridge University. Uh, after Marshall graduated from the University of Manitoba, um, he won a scholarship to Cambridge, uh, Trinity Hall, and this uh, was in the height of the Great Depression when people didn't have a lot or any money um, so the only way he could do it was uh, through scholarship. And in fact, he couldn't even afford the passage on ship. So he worked his way over on a cattle boat, um, shoveling up after cows crossing the Atlantic Ocean, which you can imagine <laughs> was not a lot of fun. But Marshall says, in the summer of 1932, I walked and biked through most of England, carrying a copy of Palgrave's golden treasury. There had never been any doubt in my mind that art and poetry were an indictment of human insentience past and present. He continues, after a conventional and devoted initiation to poetry as a romantic rebellion against mechanical industry and bureaucratic stupidity, Cambridge was a shock. Richards, Levis, Eliot, and Pound, and Joyce, in a few weeks, opened the doors of perception on the poetic process and its role in adjusting the reader to the contemporary world. And this is an important point because he speaks about the role of poetry to adjust the reader to the contemporary world. He speaks a lot about the arts as teaching us how to perceive the situation around us. At the end here, he says, uh, my study of media began and remains rooted in the work of these men. Thomas Nash was a Cambridge pet in my terms there. I did my doctoral study on him, approaching him via the process of verbal training from the sophists through Cicero and Augustine and Dante to the Renaissance. Now, this is an important bit. When Joyce quipped to a critic, James Joyce, some of my puns are trivial and some are quadrivial, he was being, as always, precise. When my critics imagine I am being vaguely metaphorical, I too am trying to be literal 
and precise. This is very important because Marshall is always explicit that he's saying exactly what he means, uh, although he's doing it metaphorically. Take that into consideration when you're reading his work because he's not playing with you. He's being very serious here. He concludes, all this is merely to say that my juvenile devotion to romantic poetry is closely related to my present concerns with the effects of the media in, my, in our personal and political lives. Um, he's saying quite explicitly here the connection between his studies in poetry and his studies in technology, um, that they are one and the same. Um, I was fortunate a couple of years ago uh, to come across a file here in my father's library um, with two typewritten pages titled Autobiography by Marshall McLuhan. And I have no idea, I haven't found that it was published anywhere, but it's a, it's a wonderful small two-page thing which I reproduced in a little booklet. Um, and it's, it's so succinct. He says, uh, coming back to the arts, style is a way of seeing said Flaubert. And since Flaubert, art and literature have consciously assumed the task of probing our new technological environments. Art and literature have revealed the characters of the new environments created by technologies by setting up counter environments. This idea of environment and counter environment um, are very integral to Marshall's work. Uh, and the role of the artist, as he sees it, is providing these counter environments or situations or ways or backgrounds against which to see where we are today. Um, he felt that the artist was uh, in a unique place because the artist, and it's kind of a capital A artist, the artist is the person in society who is always honing um, sharpening their faculties, their senses, in order to experience things anew. And because of this, they experience things before the rest of us generally do. Uh, we don't spend day in, day out trying to sharpen our, our wits and our perceptive faculties. So this is what the artist does. And then the artist presents it to us through the written word, through poetry, through painting, through sculpture, through new media, um, through whichever tools are available. Uh, and Marshall, Marshall's unique, it seems, ability was to be able to read this and to interpret it and to make sense of it. Um, oftentimes, the artists present us things that are so new that they, uh, they provoke uh, a strong response to us. You see this especially generationally where um, you know older people don't understand the younger people's music or it hurts your ears. Um, and this is, this is true across generations. Um, I mean, Elvis Presley, uh, when he was new, was a controversial figure. Today, he's tame and quaint, but at the time, um, it was a slap in the face of convention. Um, this is the artist uh, showing us and putting on the current situation. Um, Marshall continues, I had begun my university studies as a student of engineering because, my interest, because of my interest in structure and design. It becomes more clear each day that structure and design in all levels of human organization are becoming orchestral. Our new electric age no longer presents any specialized cultural gradient. Ours is the age of the zero gradient in which all times and all cultures are in a continuous dialogue. To be a participant in this dialogue is most satisfying. Marshall, although he, he was frustrated at times that he seemed to see things that nobody else did, says here that to be a participant in this dialogue was satisfying. So there was a certain satisfaction in uh, understanding things and being part of it. 
even if he had a hard time sometimes getting the message out to the rest of us. So um, I'll move on because there's lots more to say, but the, the important thing to take away here is that uh, McLuhan was an expert in English literature, specifically modernist poetry, uh, Ezra Pound, uh, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce in particular, um, who turned the things that he learned, the techniques of literary criticism, how to evaluate and understand how poetry works. And he took these tools and turned them on society, on culture and technology to understand how they work and what their grammars and languages are. Um, which is a stroke of genius uh, that if, if you could summarize his work uh, and his important contributions, that is, is up there among them. Of course, when, when you talk about Marsha McLuhan, a few things come up to people immediately. One is uh, Woody Allen's movie, Annie Hall, uh, where Marsha McLuhan gets pulled from off screen and tells the person in line that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and another one is this phrase, the medium is the message. Um, and it's caused a lot of trouble over the years. Uh, when I started the McLuhan Institute about four years ago, I decided to focus on the medium is the message because it's such a touchstone. Um, almost everybody has heard it. Uh, and it's, uh, there's a lot of debate around it, around what it means. Um, so I decided to con uh, concentrate on it and I've done a lot of research into it. And what I'm trying to find out is uh, a definite timeline for it. So when did Marsha McLuhan first say the medium is the message? And when did he last say the medium is the message? And what are all the ways that he said it over the years? Um, because the interesting thing, as I mentioned, there's this wonderful um, archive of Marshall's speech and writing uh, that we can access. And when you look at it, Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message hundreds of times uh, in between those two points. And each time he said it, he said it a little bit differently. So um, rather than try to explain it myself, I find the best way is to point people again toward the primary source. Go listen to Marsha McLuhan saying it a few different ways, and you can piece them together and form your own understanding. Uh, because the wonderful thing about it is it's five simple words, the medium is the message. Um, but there's so many, um, it's one of these things like a, a children's toy that you put into water and you watch it grow and expand and it becomes this great huge thing bigger than it started with. Uh, that's the nature of the paradox. Um, so I discovered that, uh, well, a lot of people think that he first said it in Understanding Media in 1964. In fact, he said it earlier. Some people even think he said it in The Medium is the Massage um, a bit later. But uh, it happens that he first said it at a radio broadcasters conference in British Columbia, Canada in 1958. Um, and I, I found a note in his own handwriting where he says he was trying to reassure them, the radio broadcasters, that television couldn't end radio. Um, television was new. Radio had been in charge for a few decades. And with the coming of television, the radio people were really worried that um, they were going to be obsolete, meaning that they were going to go away and die. Well, Marshall believed that obsolescence didn't mean death. It just meant a change. So he was trying to tell them that, look, radio provides a vital function and it provides it in a unique way that television can't. Television does something else. So radio, the time of radio's primacy may be over, but it's not going anywhere. And indeed that's, that's borne out. Uh, here we have a local radio station that started just a few years ago. Um, and it's very much, I know in Latin America, radio is a very important institution as well. Um, as for where Marshall got it, how did Marshall come to say the medium is the message? Um, the most fun explanation I can provide is something that happened 
on October 17, 1957, six months before Marshall first said it. And that is the launch of a Russian satellite called Sputnik. Um, and there's this uh, article Marshall wrote called, at the moment of Sputnik, the planet became a global theater in which there are no spectators, but only actors. This article was written in 1973. So it's a little bit after the fact. Marshall didn't connect the dots until later. But what's important here is, I'm sure you've also heard the global village. Well, Marshall used the term global village to refer to the environment created by radio. When radio was king, we had the global village. Here Marshall says, at the moment of Sputnik, October 1957, the world became a global theater from global village to global theater in which there are no spectators, but only actors. In the radio world, um, the audience is a spectator. You sit there and listen. In the global theater, in the larger electric world, we're all on stage. And he provided, uh, this might be his mother's influence, but he described Sputnik going around the world as creating a proscenium arch. And the proscenium arch is at the head of the stage in a theater. It's that arch around the stage, which encapsulates the performance. So uh, in the global theater, we are all performers. And he says here, perhaps the largest conceivable revolution in information occurred on October 17, 1957, when Sputnik created a new environment for the planet. For the first time, the natural world was completely enclosed in a man-made container. At the moment that the earth went inside this new artifact, nature ended and ecology was born. Ecological thinking became inevitable as soon as the planet moved up into the status of a work of art. So Marshall traces the birth of ecology, the ecological mindset, seeing our planet as something that needs to be tended to, and ecological thinking and speaking as a result of this distance provided by a new view of Earth from Sputnik in the satellite environment, which is very interesting. Six months later, he told the audience in British Columbia that the medium is the message, which is essentially an ecological statement. Um, and here it is. Uh, this is what he said. Print by permitting people to read at high speed and above all to read alone and silently developed a totally new set of mental operations. What I mentioned earlier becomes very relevant here. The medium is the message. The medium of print is the message more than any individual writer could say. Marshall is never saying that content is irrelevant. He's saying in terms of the reorganization of society, in terms of the effect on our senses and our psychology, what exactly we say is less important than the total effects of how we're saying it. That's what he's describing as the medium, which um, he'll say here, let's see. In, um, in the introduction to the second edition of Understanding Media, uh, Marshall says, the section on the medium is the message can perhaps be clarified that by pointing out that any technology gradually creates a new environment. Environments are not passive wrapping, wrappings, but active processes. The medium is the message means in terms of the electronic age that a totally new environment has been created. The content of this new environment is the old mechanized environment of the industrial age. The new environment reprocesses the old one as radically as TV is reprocessing the film. For the content of TV is the movie. TV is an environmental and imperceptible like all environments. We are only aware of the content of the old environment. 
Each new technology creates an environment that is itself regarded as corrupt and degrading, yet the new one turns its predecessor into an art form. Uh, I, I have a, a large collection of these quotes and they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, for example, one interviewer asks, why is the medium is the mess? Why is the medium the message? Why is not the message the message? And Marshall responds, where would you look for the message in an electric light? The medium and the message are the same. Um, it's really interesting to uh, look at the different ways that Marshall used this phrase over the years. Um, and really, I do find it most illuminating to return to Marshall's own words. Ironically, here I am you know, talking about them to you. And it, but I, I always encourage people to go back to the original um, sources. Um, if the reading is a little bit dense, um, try clips on YouTube, or uh, there's a site called marshallmcluhanspeaks.com, um, which is run by uh, one of the members of my family. And it's a great collection of uh, little clips of Marshall McLuhan speaking. There's an interesting some people say that, um, you know, how to go into this. There's a turn in Marshall McLuhan's work. Early on uh, in his early years as an English professor, um, as I showed you with the book on literary criticism, Marshall wrote a lot. He wrote book reviews, he wrote articles, he wrote books. Um, after understand, was under, understanding media was sort of the last one he wrote alone. Following that, um, his books are with co-authors, um, including my father, Eric McLuhan. And this is not because Marshall couldn't write. And if you, if you look at his writing, you could see that he can write. Um, but he, he, he changed his methods. He went from uh, primarily writing by hand to dialogue. And uh, he did this for the differences between the two forms. Um, when you write by, I can type about 80 words a minute. I can write 40 or 50 and I can speak much faster. And this, the speed of your delivery uh, affects uh, your delivery. It affects the content actually. It affects your brain and your mental processes. Um, and so when I, when I write a, a speech or an article, um, I tend to do the drafts in hand to slow down my mind, to slow down that process. Marshall found uh, the quality of dialogue to be more engaging. And this is why I've, uh, I've changed my own speaking method to, um, instead of preparing speeches, uh, to speak more freely, to write some notes, and then to speak from that. Um, that's especially important when you're doing things remotely and it's really hard to engage with an audience. Uh, I'm getting just about zero feedback from all of you here. Uh, uh, so you do what you can. In person, you can gauge the audience. And when you find you're losing them, you can try and get back on track or uh, things of this nature. Um, anyway, Marshall found uh, the quality of dialogue to be more engaging and more suited to today's audience, which was post-literate. And he started talking about post-literacy back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he knew not where we were headed, but where we were. And this is another po important point that um, people talk about uh, Marshall predicting. And he said, I'm very careful to only predict things which have already happened. And again, back to his quote that he's being literal, he's, he's being literal. And this also comes back to his idea of the artist, um, that the artist sees the present um, where we're living back in the previous age. So Marshall um, was describing his present, which today, when we say, oh my gosh, he was talking about the internet, he was talking about today. What he was talking about happened 60 years ago to him. 
And if you let that sit with you for a minute, it's a little bit spooky because if we see today what he was talking about then, what's happening today that we're not seeing? Uh, and that <laughs> is a little bit spooky, but um, let's, let's move on. Marshall McLuhan's legacy. So um, understanding media. After Marshall did that speech where he first said the medium is a message, he started on a project. Um, he was hired by the NAEB, and that's the National Association of Educational Broadcasters in the United States. He was hired by them to produce a syllabus for high school for understanding new media. And indeed, he did deliver a report, a report this is a, a copy of it here, called the Report on Project in Understanding New Media. Um, he also called it Project 69 or VAT 69 because it was the 69th grant uh, handed out by the NAEB. So he referred to it as that. Um, and this is a, a very interesting document um, in the 2003 edition of Understanding Media by Ginkgo Press, uh, in the back, there's an appendix which has a few parts from it, um, which is interesting to look at. Um, and it gives a general introduction to the language and grammars of the media, followed by introduction to speech, writing, print, press, photography, etc. I'll read you just a little bit. This is how he opens it. Early in 1960, it dawned on me that the sensory impression proffered by a medium like television, like movie or radio, was not the sensory effect obtained. Radio, for example, had an intense visual effect on listeners. But then there is the telephone, which also proffers an auditory impression, but has no visual effect. In the same way, television is watched, but has very different effect from the movies. These observations led to a series of studies of the media and to the discovery of basic laws concerning the sensory effects of various media. These will be found in this report. This is a very important point here that uh, one of Marshall's primary interests was the sensory effects of technologies how these new uh, technologies affect the senses individually. Um, you know, and I'm not just talking about our ear, uh, eyes and ears and taste and touch, but uh, the many more senses like kinesthesia, um, the individual senses, and then the balance or the ratio among the senses. Um, he continues on. Nothing could be more unrealistic than to suppose that the programming for such media could affect their power to repattern the sense ratios of our beings. This is the medium is the message said another way. Uh, and he goes on, the language and grammar of a medium have nothing to do with its content or programming. It's a really interesting report and um, one of the interesting parts about it, especially when you put it up beside understanding media, is the style. Um, this was written for the NAEB as a report for educators. Um, and although it has the McLuhan flavor, it's essentially fairly straightforward prose. This was delivered in 1960. Um, in the years following, uh, Marshall would also published The Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man, but he was working on the report and writing it and rewriting it and adding chapters, looking at different media that weren't discussed in there like money and comics uh, and other things. Um, and he eventually published it in 1964 as Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, or as you might know it, um, La Comp Prancion de los medios como las exten extensiones del hombre, uh, which was the uh, the Spanish edition, which is a lot of fun. 
sorry for my pronunciation. Um, understanding media, I'm currently teaching a course on understanding media, uh, which when it will be done is 36 classes, three hours each, um, going through uh, the book, chasing down all the literary allusions and the phrases that he mentions um, and bringing everything I ever learned to bear to help my students uh, explore this text. And it's really interesting to see how relevant it is to today. Why it is relevant today speaks to what it is. And it's organized into two sections. The first part, um, the first seven chapters are ways of seeing or perceiving. Um, and uh, the medium is the message, media hot and cool, narcissus as narcosis. Um, these are Marshall showing his methods. The second part, the other 26 chapters are him applying these techniques from part one into various technologies in part two. And he does it very poetically um, because he was writing intentionally for kind of for the ear. He wasn't writing for his colleagues in English literature, but for the people of the day. This makes it hard for us to read today because, um, <laughs> well, we're 60 plus years removed from that. We're much different people. Um, there are a lot of things in here that uh, I keep a dictionary handy. I also have something called the Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, which is very useful because, um, you know, when talking about nar the Narcissus myth, or um, various other phrases that are outdated now. They're all in the, that reference work and that's very handy. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to, to look through the book today and to read it so deeply and pull apart. And, and like that children's child's toy that you put in water and expands, um, understand media is poetic like that. Uh, when you when you look into it, it, it grows. It contains uh, environments in, in condensed forms. Um, so this was the book that really launched Marshall's career. Um, it, he became very well known for it uh, in public. He had already gotten a large reputation in academia and in literary circles for his work. He was an expert in modernist poetry, especially Eliot, uh, Pound, and Joyce. Um, but now he reached the wider world. And that's a whole other story of how that happened because it wasn't an accident, um, but intentional. And um, about 10 years, almost 10 years later in 1972, Marshall was approached by the publisher to do a 10th anniversary edition. The book had sold really well. It had been translated into dozens of languages. Uh, it was a hit. So um, let's do a 10th anniversary edition. Marshall, um, my father was working with him by this time. My father, Eric McLuhan, began to work with Marshall in the mid 1960s, um, went with him to Fordham University in 67, 68, and would remain working with him up until Marshall's death in 1980. Uh, following Marshall's death, Eric McLuhan kept on um, and in this library for the last 15 years of his life, um, put out works like media informal cause, theories of communication, uh, as well as his own uh, solo work. Um, Marshall and Eric were working together at the time in 72, and Marshall used the opportunity to go back over the book and see what he missed, and also address uh, concerns of the critics. And one of the main concerns of the critics were that it wasn't scientific. And this interested Marshall, and he decided to see if any scientific statements could be made about technology. Um, they called this project UMR, or Understanding Media Revised. So we've gone from the report in 1960 to Understanding Media in 1964 to UMR in 1972, 1973. The work that they did with UMR would eventually be published as Laws of Media, The New Science in 1988. Um, it was much, much more than the publisher wanted for a 10th anniversary edition. It was uh, an, an entire new book. 
Um, and uh, where are we? Okay. Um, this is one of the first publications of the Laws of Media Material, et cetera, magazine, um, which was uh, from the uh, Institute uh, or the Society of General Semantics. Um, and what Marshall and Eric set out to do was, are there any laws of media? That is in the scientific sense where you have laws of motion or laws of relativity, laws of gravity. Are there anything, any statements that could be made about all technologies? Um, because there are lots of things you can say about this technology or that technology, but what do technologies all do? So that was the criteria. And they came up with four things, which they phrased as questions. And that's important as well. They found um, that uh, the questions they asked were of any technology, what does it enhance? What does it obsolesce? What does it retrieve from the past? And when you push it to an extreme, what does it turn into? So um, what does it enhance? That is, what does it uh, make it easier for us to do? What does it speed up or make more convenient? Um, what does it obsolesce in that um, a new technology always takes over from something we were always doing? And that thing gets um, put into a sort of subservient role where if it's not outright, outright killed, it's replaced. Um, the retrieval bit, they found that all technologies, all new technologies bring back something from the past, which is very interesting. Um, it's also very difficult uh, to evaluate because in order to understand what's being retrieved from the past, you have to know a lot about the past. So that can be difficult. Uh, historians and the field of media archeology span are very helpful in that regard. And lastly, um, the flip or reversal. Uh, they found that all technologies, when you push them, their use to an extreme, tend to reverse their characteristics. So for an example, um, the, the highway uh, enhances um, travel for many people on the road um, to get from A to B. It pushes back you know, side roads and smaller routes. Um, when you push it to an extreme, if you get too many cars on the road at one time, you get a traffic jam, traffic halts, and that is the reversal of the function, the flip. So they found um, that all human technologies do these four things. Um, they were always looking for more and they never found them. And the criteria is that it has to, it has to be true of a paperclip as much as a photograph or a fork or anything, uh, any human artifact. Uh, and so that's a very tight criteria. Um, the utility of laws of media should be pretty obvious. I mean, um, especially today when we want to understand the technologies we're creating. Um, you know, when you begin writing or when you begin painting, the hard thing to confront is that blank canvas, that blank page. Technologically speaking, laws of media gives you four things you already know that the technology is going to do. And that's really helpful um, because you know once you get going, uh, momentum counts for a lot. Um, so it's really interesting that this project begun in 1958, 960, um, takes on these uh, different dimensions from uh, the report to understanding media to laws of media in 1988. Um, and as far as Marshall McLuhan's legacy goes, uh, how he felt about it, he said, I found a note written by my grandmother. He said in 1978, I consider my greatest achievement in the discovery that all human artifacts, all the extensions of man, are patterned structurally on the mode of the word. And laws of media is very much 
uh, a meditation on the linguistic structure of technologies. Um, of course, it shouldn't be much of a surprise that a, an English a literature prof should discover the literary nature of the extensions of man of technologies. Um, you might also say it's inevitable or that uh, you could say various things about it, but um, and here I've spoken for almost an hour already and there's so much to say. Let me, let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, space, time and poetry. We've already talked a little bit about space and time uh, in McLuhan and the interesting thing, um, Marsha would say things like, in the electronic age, all times are our time, you know? Um, and that's illustrated by the fact that uh, to get to know Marsha McLuhan, you can just go to YouTube and visit him in 1968. Um, in effect, you know, uh, it is a kind of time traveling. And here we are transcending space uh, right now where I'm speaking from uh, a hundred year old barn in rural Ontario, uh, yet I'm also there in Uruguay and I'm in Brazil and I'm in Montana and uh, who knows where else. And I'm also maybe in the year 2050 on whatever replaces YouTube uh, because this is being recorded. And maybe I'm watching this myself 30 years later. Uh, it's, it's a very strange, um, a very strange thing. Um, I wanna talk about at least one more pair of ideas from Marshall that were very important to him uh, concerning space. And this has to do with what he called acoustic space and visual space. Um, and early, another name for laws of media, what they referred to was the visual space essay. Um, it starts earlier with acoustic space. And uh, in the early 1950s at the University of Toronto, there was what they called, it's now kind of referred to as the Toronto School, but there was what they called the explorations group. Um, Marshall McLuhan and Edmund Carpenter received a grant from the Ford Foundation um, to do a seminar in culture and communication. Uh, the product of this seminar was a magazine, uh, a journal called Explorations. And it's, um, it went through eight, nine issues, pardon me, and they were highly sought after. It was a, a group of thinkers across various fields, sociology, anthropology, English, psychology, um, architecture, all fields. This was somewhat revolutionary at the time. And this was a lot of the trouble that Marshall ran into because although we can speak quite naturally of interdisciplinary studies today, um, in the earlier 20th century, that was frowned on. Um, people were expected to specialize and to stay in their lane. Um, and you weren't very welcome to go into other people's fields. However, in Marshall's work, in the work of understanding media, you necessarily have to have that ecological, that wide approach. Uh, as Marshall said, understanding is not a point of view. If you wanna understand something, you need to apprehend the gestalt, the, the full picture. Um, and figuring ground from Gestalt psychology are very important uh, terms to Marshall McLuhan as well. But to acoustic and visual space. Um, acoustic space, Marshall uh, got from one of the members of the explorations team, Carl Williams. And Carl Williams was a psychologist. He wrote uh, an article, I think it went into Explorations 4, on what he had called auditory space. Um, Marshall's work was very much uh, building off the work of others. Um, people like James Joyce, uh, people like Harold Innes. Um, Marshall said that his work was a footnote to Innes. He also said that his work was applied Joyce. He wasn't um, hesitant to give credit uh, where credit is due. His kind of genius was in taking these ideas and pushing them forward and taking them in different directions. Um, 
some people have said he's not a very original thinker, and that could be partially true. But what he was really great at was connecting dots that nobody else saw relation to um, the resonance between things. Um, so uh, visual and acoustic space um, refer to um, the kind of space experienced by the eye uh, versus the kind of space experienced by the ear. Um, and this, uh, Marshall used these terms to describe some of the major changes in technology and people. Um, before uh, literacy and the written word, when um, the spoken word was king, people, um, the world was between your voice and your ear. Uh, that made it an acoustic world. And in, in the world and space as understood by the ear, everything happens at once. You hear from all points, you hear from all around you. Um, it's a resonance fear, as he called it. Uh, he provides a little, uh, actually funnily, this is uh, a 1960 article called The Medium is the Message, um, but he provides here in brackets, since the early 19th century, with the arrival of electrical problems and processes, Mathematics and physics have moved away from visual organization and statistics toward dynamics, time organization, and what psychologists refer to as auditory space. Auditory space is that sphere of simultaneous relations created by the act of hearing. We hear from all directions at the same time. This creates a unique, unvisualizable space. So um, this idea, uh, this is an example of Marshall taking a metaphor and really running with it um, because Marshall takes this idea of the simultaneous and it extends to the whole experience of humanity in the pre-literate age and in the post-literate age uh, because as he goes into, he and Eric go into and under, uh, sorry, laws of media, Visual space is what was created with the alphabet. Um, and I have a passage marked out here. Um, with the representation of the abstract consonant, then began the separation of the eye from the other senses and the separation of inner from outer experience. Um, writing. Uh, which took the sound away from things, um, placed the emphasis on the eye. And the eye doesn't work uh, the same way the ear does. Where the ear hears everything around you, the eye sees generally in one direction from a fixed perspective. Um, and that means you look at one thing at a time, generally. Um, by extension, uh, when you put that into society and its effect on people, it starts to manifest there as well. Um, it gives you perspective. Uh, one place to look at this is um, a book that Marshall did with Harley Parker called Through the Vanishing Point, Space in Time, uh, sorry, Space in Poetry and Painting. And this is an examination of poetry and painting together in exploration of acoustic and visual space. Um, I'm afraid I've, I've touched on more things than I could really go very deeply into. Um, but to try and answer this question of what Marshall McLuhan's legacy is, um, there are a few things that are notable. Um, he speaks very explicitly about the training of perception and of paying attention. Uh, and a lot of his work is geared toward enabling you to do this. Understanding media is a, a toolkit, uh, a book called City is Classroom, Understanding Language in Media is another toolkit for training perception. Um, and he urges us to pay attention, uh, to observe and to understand, uh, and thereby try and have some control over our technological circumstance. Uh, because as somebody said of his work, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. 
well, it would be really great if we um, shaped our tools a little more consciously. Um, Marshall liked to bring up the work of Edgar Allan Poe uh, for a few reasons, but in particular, his story of the descent into the maelstrom. And in this story, there's a, a fisherman, a sailor, and he and his brother are out in the ocean. And where they live, there's this giant vortex in the ocean. Um, and everybody knows about it. You stay away from it. But one day his brother, uh, they're out in the ocean, they're fishing, and they get a little too close to the maelstrom. And before they can get away, they're sucked into it. And his brother loses his mind and jumps overboard and he's lost. Um, but the sailor, because it takes so long, this thing is huge. He's going down and down and down. And he, uh, the sailor is um, prone to noticing things and to analyzing. Once the terror, initial terror, wears off, he starts to look at what's happening. And he notices that things are going down, but every once in a while, an object is going up and, and going out. And this is really interesting. And he pays attention and he discovers that uh, it's predictable and certain types of objects will do this. So with that in mind, he prepares himself and he times it and he picks his object and he jumps out and he's carried out of the vortex and washed ashore later. And Marshall used this story as an analogy to us and to our technological circumstance. And against this kind of silly charge of technological determinism, Marshall's overwhelming message is that of hope and uh, that we do have a chance to escape through understanding uh, by paying attention. Um, that we might design for net human benefit and not simply monetization and, and things like that. Um, and his legacy, I believe, is all the wonderful things he left behind to help us in this task, uh, in his books, in his interviews. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Andrew. Bueno, este, hay mucho más para decir. Te agradecemos enormemente la capacidad de síntesis eh, que has tenido en poder generar bueno, un, un recorrido en, en los puntos importantes este, de su legado, no es un, un trabajo menor. Eh, vamos a abrir ahora la posibilidad este, para quienes están en sala, si quieren hacer eh, comentarios o intercambiar o preguntar eh, o, o de pronto este, profundizar en los diferentes aspectos este, que, tú, que tú has planteado. Este, así que eh, abrimos eh, la posibilidad, este, está aquí el profesor Fernando Andach, que es el director de comunicación de la Facultad de Información y Comunicación de la UDELAR. Le agradecemos este, su presencia. Eh, si, si pueden habilitar las cámaras para, para dar este, eh, una visualización mejor en el streaming y también en sala. Profesor Andach, adelante. Mm, bueno, voy a hablar en inglés para más directo. I'll try to to phrase as clearly and clearly as possible. First of all, uh, great seeing you again, Andrew. Congrats for this wonderful, uh, you can say, trip through uh, the legacy, uh, wonderful uh, ideas that Marshall McLuhan, a scholar and grandfather of yours, left us. You know, the first thing that came to my mind with this uh, marvelous uh, phrase, almost a haiku, right? <laughs> so powerful, poetical and suggestive, the medium is the message. I was thinking all the time of another Canadian born in an obscure little town in Alberta, if I'm not wrong, Irving Goffman, whose work came up uh, also in the Joshua Mayrovitz uh, talk. And um, one of the key concepts he, he left us, everybody talks about the dramaturgical model. However, he uh, developed, just as you said, Marsha McLuhan had a gift for developing people's ideas like Joycean language, which is so innovative and creative and strange. Uh, he took Gregory Bateson's idea of the frame, the frame and, and this wonderful essay you, you told us about, about the Sputnik, creating 
a great new environment, a new wrapping of the whole world, I was thinking of this notion, Goffmanian or Goffmanesque notion of the frame, how the setting of a speech act or of a scene uh, in the internet, you know, on YouTube, as you said, watching this talk in the YouTube in 50 years was so different from participating, even though with all these strange, uncanny limitations of this Zoom interaction. And uh, that is what I think one of the great things that this uh, notion of the medium is the message left us to pay attention to this context, but it's more than a context. Um, the frame idea is, is impossible to improve. It's like in a painting, right? You tend to ignore <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, what sets apart the painting from the rest of the world. <clears throat> Just like television brought images on the world outside into the living room and maybe changed the, you know, the Vietnam War. And, and also I, I recall a wonderful interview to Marsha McLuhan about a debate between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford and how he says very starkly, they don't know anything about television. They were disastrous. <laughs> this, uh, he was teaching them something incredible, exactly what you pointed out so nicely, how to look at things differently, how to perceive anew the world, because a world with television is different from without, a world with internet is different from a world before. So thanks a lot, I, I really appreciate it. And I think I, I got a new insight, a new, uh, way of, of reading, or I'm, I'm eager to reread uh, some of the books in my uh, bookshelves by Marsha McLuhan and, and also put it into my own writing and classes and so on. So thank you. It was great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ndacht. Um, you, bring up, you bring up some interesting points. One thing which is worth noting is um, it's always worth it to revisit texts. Um, Marshall did it in his own work. Um, if a book was good in 1930, it was good in 1940 for Marshall. And one of the reasons is that, um, you know, you're a different person 10 years later. Um, you've, your, your knowledge, your experience have changed who you are. And so to read understanding for myself, to read understanding media as a teenager was not very successful. To read it in my 20s was a little more successful. Um, to read it now in my 40s is a very different thing. And uh, I've gotten a lot more from it this time around. Um, I'd suggest you doing the same thing. Um, and it sounds like you will, so I'm, I'm not really speaking to you, I suppose, but. Um, it, uh, I learned this from Marshall because um, I spent a year and a half, one of the first things I did in McLuhan work was spend a year and a half documenting and inventorying Marsha McLuhan's books. And he had a library like the one I'm in now of around 6,000 volumes, which he annotated um, very heavily. Um, and the way that Marshall worked was, um, I don't know anybody who read as many books as he did. He was always reading. Um, when, he, when he read a book and something jumped out at him, he made a note and uh, in the pages and then indexed to the back. Um, and when I was doing the inventory of his books, I discovered that um, because uh, the handwriting you have when you're a youth is different from the handwriting in your older age. So when I looked at Marshall's books, I could see that he'd come back to these books over and over and discovered new things. So it's really interesting that you can chart his intellectual development um, through his, the, the books in his library, which is fascinating and very interesting. Um, but it's, uh, it's as much to say that um, it's, it's definitely useful to, to return to, to books later on. Um, and may, maybe discover something new when you do. Thank you, Professor, uh, for, for your attendance. Appreciate it. Muchas gracias, Professor Andach. Continuamos. Si alguien más quiere hacer algún comentario o aporte, o quieren eh, hacer alguna pregunta también, directamente con Andrew. Pueden hacerla en español, en inglés. 
eh, Félix eh, había estado preguntando, Félix Redux, que creo que es de, eh, de Brasil, había estado preguntando si había algún, ¿Is the second page autobiography available somewhere? Así que... Yeah. Um, I don't have it listed on my website, but um, if you email me, uh, the address is andrew at the McLuhan Institute .com. Um, Email me, uh, I can send you one. They're $10 plus shipping. Perfect. Uh, I, I think I know where you're going. Um, Marshall had a lot to say about consciousness. Uh, he referred a lot to the work of Eric Havelock, who wrote a book called Preface to Plato. And that's all about um, the experience of people um, in the time before the written word, um, when the main uh, way of transmitting knowledge was from voice to ear. Um, and so the poets um, were uh, very highly placed in society because they were the ones who, who carried forward the knowledge. Um, and he was very interested in the experience of the people who heard um, because it was, it was very different in, in this culture before print. And that was um, what they called mimesis. Uh, as a way of experience. And mimesis wasn't merely imitating, but um, when the poets were speaking, uh, the people who heard weren't just uh, passively listening like you or I right now, but they became involved to such an extent that they uh, became part of the story. Their experience was so in depth that they identified so totally with the material that they were part of the story. They weren't just an audience, a separated listener. So there was no distance. Um, they were uh, a very vital part of it. Uh, and this is important to understand the experience of people today in the post-literate condition. Um, and by post-literate, again, he doesn't mean that uh, we don't have books that we don't read and write, because we do, obviously, but uh, reading and writing don't hold the same position they once did. Um, we get uh, our information mainly uh, electronically, um, through listening to things, through reading things online, and to read something online is a very different experience than to read it on a paper. And this is very important because uh, they're not the same thing at all. To read on a screen, you have um, the light coming through uh, to you. Whereas when you're reading from a page, the light is hitting the page and reflecting. And these mean very different things in terms of your sensory experience. Uh, and that is uh, the point of the distinction between them, light on between light through. So um, while in the post-literate age, we don't exactly return to the pre-literate sensibility, we have much more in common with it than we do with the literate sensibility, if that makes any sense. To me, this explains how um, cultures become global. And for example, with hip hop, um, there are kids here in the small town who identify so completely with that culture um, that they are part of it, even though they're actually very far removed from it. But they have this really intimate identification and becoming, uh, which is profound. And um, they're not just imitating or pretending. This is their identity. And that's, that's how mimesis works. Uh, I kind of lost, uh, so consciousness. Um, so that has a lot to do with um, our inner experience and what consciousness is, which is um, an awareness, uh, I guess an awareness of ourselves uh, in relation to ourselves and to each other and what kind of separates us from, uh, you know, the animal kingdom. 
where an animal like a fox doesn't have a consciousness in the same uh, area that we do. That consciousness, that separation um, was something which, um, you know, Marshall believed and others uh, was a result of literacy and this, uh, this breakdown in objectivity afforded by uh, visual technologies like the printed word versus um, the uh, acoustic world. I hope that helps a little bit, Thelma. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Felix is asking in the chat uh, this question. Was Marshall McLuhan a big reader of Whitehead? And if he was, what was its significance? I don't know too much about the relationship between uh, Marshall McLuhan and Alfred North Whitehead. Um, Obviously, they were alive at the same time. They were colleagues, so there there was certainly um, a relationship there. Um, I'm not familiar enough with it to really speak to it, um, but it it shouldn't be too difficult uh, to track it down. There may be um, some correspondence between the two. There's a book called um, uh, The Letters of Marshall McLuhan. Um, which features a lot of his correspondence. Um, and I think there are some whitehead letters in there that would uh, be worth looking at. Uh, by the way, just, just to talk about that for a second, it is worth looking, um, aside from going to YouTube or to listening to things or to Marshall's writings, uh, it's really interesting to look at his correspondence. Um, and a lot of this was collected in a volume called The Letters of Marshall McLuhan. Um, and it's, it's amazing uh, to see the, the, this written correspondence because um, today uh, it's really hard to keep up a written correspondence between people. I don't know if anybody um, does much letter writing. Uh, I try to, and it's very difficult. Um, it's hard to mail a letter off to somebody and not get something back for three or four weeks. You know, It's hard to keep a conversation going. And that's just with one person. But when you look at um, the nature of correspondence, uh, the world of letters in the 20th century, um, it's quite remarkable uh, to see that was how most people communicated at a distance, um, was through a written correspondence. Um, it, forces, it forces you to be uh, to certain types of conversations. Um, and Marshall was, was very lucid and brilliant in his written correspondence. Uh, and it's worth looking at to get a, a deeper look into his work. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, another person uh, mentioned the link between Giddens and McLuhan. Uh, do, do you want to explain a little bit more deeply regarding that? Between whom? Giddens. The socialists, British socialists. Oh, uh, Gideon? Giddens. Uh, Siegfried Gideon, is that who we're speaking about? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so Gideon wrote a book called Space, Time and Architecture. Um, Siegfried Gideon, he wrote a couple of books um, which are, I know were important to Marshall um, I cataloged him, uh, them when I did uh, his library inventory. That was 10 years ago now, so uh, or more. So I, I don't remember all the details. Um, there are a lot of people who chase down these little connections. Um, if you do a search online, there's, um, there's a, a blog called Light Through McLuhan which um, looks at a lot of interesting topics. And there's uh, someone named Cameron McEwen who has done a lot of interesting kind of away from the mainstream uh, look at McLuhan's work. Um, because there are, uh, most people are, are interested in the popular McLuhan understanding media, commentary, the mainstream stuff, but there's a lot of things in the sidelines um, that are interesting, his literary work for one thing. Um, oh, sorry, 
Anthony Giddens. Um, I'm not familiar with that name, I'm afraid. Sorry, Felix. Okay, it's, it's no problem. This is this is the thing is that um, it's it's a huge body of work. <laughs> it's a it's a huge world, and um, even though I'm kind of a McLuhan specialist, which is a bit of a joke, uh, because Marshall was a generalist, um, I've been studying this uh, work for just over ten years, and I've only just scraped scratched the surface of it. Uh, my advantage is um, that I grew up around it. So I learned a lot of things just by being there. Um, so, uh, and my perspective is kind of that um, of an outsider because uh, Marshall and Eric McLuhan were uh, traditional scholars. They were academics um, and myself, uh, I'm not by any means. I'm largely self-taught. Um, I studied with my dad, but very informally. Um, I've, you know, I didn't go to university. So what I learned, what I've learned, I've learned basically on my own and in this library and going, going with my dad around the world on talks. Um, so that said, um, it's, it's impossible to know everything about McLuhan. So I hope I'll be forgiven to not be able to answer all questions. Um, oh, Felix asks about Douglas Copeland's biography of Marshall McLuhan. Um, there have been a few biographies of Marshall McLuhan. Actually, Douglas Copeland's is the only one I've read. Um, you have to understand that um, it's kind of a weird thing to, to be a grandson of Marshall McLuhan. And how do you want to get to know your grandfather? Do you want to get to know them through somebody's biography? Um, for myself, not so much. Um, I'll, I'll eventually read the official biography, but um, I'm, I'm not I'm not ready for that yet. Uh, but I did read Douglas Copeland's uh, because I'm an admirer of, of his work. Um, not everybody was a big fan of it. Uh, there are you know uh, hardcore McLuhan people who are very upset by it. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, again, you have to take into consider Doug's a very good writer um, and he has a particular audience and he was writing for that audience. Um, he wasn't writing for the hardcore McLuhan people or media studies people. Um, he was writing for his audience. And in that regard, I think he, he did a great job. Um, he introduced Marsha McLuhan to a lot of people who um, otherwise wouldn't have a way in, you know? Um, they would never read uh, Philip Marchand's biography or any other kind of um, formal or academic thing. But uh, Douglas Copeland's book is a lot more accessible. And, you know, uh, maybe he, he goes off in a few different directions, <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a worthwhile read. I had a lot of fun with it anyway. Bueno, muy bien, muchas gracias a todos. Vamos a, a ir cerrando este, la transmisión de, en vivo. Y este, bueno, para los que están aquí en la sala que quieran hacer alguna consulta o algo directamente con Andrew, eh, podemos seguir un ratito más. Agradecer especialmente a Lucía Bonilla y María Eugenia Sus por el trabajo de interpretación en el día de hoy. Eh, así que. Nuevamente, gracias por acompañarnos. Andrew, ha sido realmente un gusto este, que nos abrieras la biblioteca este, de tu abuelo y que pudieras mostrar diferentes publicaciones y diferentes materiales, este, algunos originales, otros publicados, este, eh, primeras ediciones, así que es realmente un, un valor este, increíble el poder este, haber 
tenido este encuentro contigo. Seguimos entonces con el, el legado de Marshall McLuhan, que los invito el 6 de mayo con Paolo Granata de la Universidad de Toronto y el 27 de mayo con Derrick de Kerkov que va a estar aquí, este está confirmado de Rick, el 27 de mayo a las 12 horas. Todos los encuentros van a ser a las 12 horas y también vamos a estar este, confirmando eh, invitados este, de la región, invitados de Uruguay, para seguir este, revalorizando el legado de Marcha Marluja. Muchas gracias a todos y nos vemos en la próxima. Thank you very much, Della, uh, Dalma, and thank you to the interpreters and uh, to all of you for, for giving me your time today. Muchas gracias. Thank you.